Uh, get started. Passing out that colorful sheet of paper to separate the next chapter. And I do not have a specific note guide for today, but I'm going to give you some paper. I'll give you two sheets just in case you need them. I haven't looked at the test yet, but the weekend is here, so I will uh, probably be spending a good part of my Sunday evening. Although with the weather getting nicer, I should probably look at the calendar and find out what the nice day is and what the crappy day is going to be. So uh, we're moving into chapter four, still talking about the atom, but we're getting toward the modern quantum model of the atom. So maybe if you would start your notes by just titling the chapter so that we know that this is what we're looking at today. Can you share your screen, please? Can you share the screen. Modeling in our front hallway there. Anyway, uh, chapter four, arrangement of electrons and atoms. It turns out to understand the quantum model of the atom, uh, it all really has most to do with the electrons in the atom. So we're gonna be spending a lot of time looking at electrons and their behaviors and their quantum behaviors in the atom, particularly in the second half of this chapter. So in the previous chapter, we talked about protons, neutrons, and electrons. And one of the important things that protons do for us is they tell us what element the atoms belong to. They give the atom their identity. And we organize the periodic table based on that atomic number or number of protons in the atom. But it turns out the protons in the nucleus, not a lot of action going on there stable, it doesn't do anything, it's not moving, it's just there in the center, giving off its positive charge. It turns out that the electrons is where all the action is at. And it's the electrons that give atoms their personality. Now that's all I want you to write from this slide, but when I talk about personality, I'm just referring to things like how atoms are going to react with other atoms. Uh, what determines their chemical and physical properties it has to do with their electrons and the electrons in the electron cloud, the type of chemical bonds they form with uh, other elements, 
whether they're sharing electrons or forming ions or whatever it might be. So really all the excitement and action is taking place in the electron cloud. And that's why this chapter is focused on electrons in the atom. So the quantum model, I want to say it's a the new model, but it's actually been around for like, I don't know, 80 years or so. But it's sticking around because uh, we keep on proving more and more things that prove that it's correct. Uh, the quantum model of the atom is primarily focused on the behavior of electrons. On this next slide, I'm not going to have you write it down. I'm just going to read it, and then I'll give you a shorter, quicker, easier way to write this. However, before we can understand electrons fully, we need to know about light. And to know about light, we need to learn about energy. And to learn about energy, we need to study waves, because energy travels in the form of waves. So this is kind of like the approach that we're going to be taking to this chapter, at least the beginning half of the chapter. And if you want to summarize, this is the sequence that we're going to be looking at things. Today, and part of Monday, we'll be looking at energy and waves. And then we'll connect that more into light, starting on Monday. And then we'll see how light is impacted by electrons or vice versa. So all that to get a better understanding of the electron. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, just start breaking down uh, some characteristics of waves that we're going to study. Um, We've had three characteristics we're going to look at, wavelength, frequency, and energy. And uh, we'll start out with wavelength. I guess the topic that we're switching over to is waves for now, and then wavelength would be the first topic under the topic of waves. First thing I have to try to do is draw a wave. I self-scored myself at a seven on my last wave that I drew. Let's see if I can get it an eight. It's another seven. Give it an eight. All right. I think my first hump is a little bit lower than that. Second hump. My right hand trough is a little bit deeper than the. Uh, eh, it's good enough. Anyway, you go do your five or six that you're going to do. You're not as practiced as I am. I'm watching. I'm scared. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. You got an eraser. That's why there's so many eraser marks on the, the oh. eraser parts on the test last time. I wow, that was it's so actually fun. easier to do it on the board than it is to do it on paper. You see, your hand gets stuck, and then you drag it a little bit. It's tough. Oh my gosh, wait. That's, that's so, so when we look at a wave, um, what do we call the top of a wave? Peak. It is the peak, but that's not the, the term that's generally used for it. 
toothpaste. I'm glad you didn't say Colgate. <laughs> we got the crest of the wave. And then uh, the bottle of wave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's what a horse drinks out of. Trough. Trough. Crests and troughs. I spell trough, right? That's a U. It looks like through, except there's no H. Trough. O U G H. Crests and troughs, the peaks and valleys of the uh, of the wave. Um, and then the other thing to measure the wavelength, we measure the distance between crest and crest. So that would be the wavelength. And we're going to give that wavelength a symbol. Which then makes you wonder, what the hell is that? Upside down, lowercase y. The symbol is uh, the lowercase Greek letter lambda, in case you're wondering where it comes from. Um, All you have to know is that it stands for wavelength. And we're going to do a little bit of math in this chapter, in this section. Um, it's algebraic, and that's our variable that we put in for wavelength. Um, there's other things we could label on the, on the diagram, but they're not really important to us. Um, we can talk about the amplitude, how high and low it goes be above and below the baseline here. Uh, we can talk about the nodes from one intersection with the baseline to another. Those are the nodes or the intersect. But a wavelength is crest to crest. Uh, it could be trough to trough. That would be the same distance. Sometimes I like to draw it just with a full crest and a full trough because that gives you a nice uh, balance of both and gives you a sense of completion. So that's the symbol that we're going to be using for that. Um, and again, it's the distance from crest to crest. Whatever it takes to get one complete cycle of the wave, which includes a full crest and a full trough, or two halves of a crest and a full trough. And because it is a length, when we go to measure wavelength, we're going to use our metric units for distance. And our base unit for that is the meter. So that's going to be our go-to unit in that equation. Although we're going to use meters when we enter it into our mathematical equation, because we have to uh, make our units align with the constants that we're going to be using. Um, we will encounter wavelengths that go down to the nanometers all the way up to the kilometers. So pretty huge range of wavelengths that we might be dealing with. Next uh, variable that we'll be working with today is that of frequency. So, uh, start you off with the symbol for frequency. Like a cursive V, italicized V. It's actually the Greek letter nu is what they're using. 
So when I try to find it on the computer, I go to symbols and I type in the lowercase letter N and that's what pops up. Go to the computer, do symbol, type in the lowercase L and Lambda pops up. In physics, they use the lowercase letter F. And people that take physics before chemistry, it really bothers them because they want to continue using it. It means the same thing. I don't know why chemistry and physics does it differently. Um, anyway, frequency. Still talking about those waves. It's the number of waves that pass a fixed point in a set amount of time. Illustrate that. I am going to put my artistic skills to the test. No, it's her hair. Her, her hair. Oh, you know, I haven't got to the hair yet. Here, I'll get the hair. You can cover it up with my hair. Oh, that is no. I think it should make some more. Maybe curly. Kind of make Alex. Just quit interrupting. This <laughs> thing going on. <laughs> It's not bad, right? Then, all right, then, uh, oh, okay, got something here. Just arms, too. His arms are in his legs. You like it? Never does the lower body, just always upper body. Um, Let's be clear on that. story talking about frequency. So if you're out on the lakes in the summer and you hear this, don't go near because it could be Alex fishing naked on a pier. <laughs> when Alex goes out to the pier, you know, he likes to unwind by fishing. You know, it's very calming, but he, his mind's still active and he starts to do a little science. And one of the things he likes to do is dangle his feet over the edge of the pier, just so they're touching the water and he likes to count the frequency of the waves passing by. So it goes something like this. You hear a little counting, one, 
two, three, and then you hear a little giggle <laughs> as the water tickles over his toes. And then he continues counting one, two, three, and then <laughs> again, and it goes on and on like that. So if you ever hear that, don't, don't go investigate, trust me. <laughs> I don't know how you do it with the slivers though. I find that piers tend to be rough and the slivers would be the thing that concerns me the most. Um, anyway, so from crest to crest, how long does it take? This is the fixed point. We're taking a look at the time it takes to go from there to there. So it could be something like the time between waves breaking on the beach. Alex has also been known to be naked on the beach, running back in, you know, you chase the waves out, then you chase the waves back in, and you go back and forth like that, whatever. We've all done it before with clothes on. Um, could be the ups and downs of an anchored boat. You know, you anchored in the middle of uh, Lake Michigan or something like that, maybe not the middle of the lake, but you're anchored somewhere in, on Lake Michigan and the waves come up and you're at the crest and then, whoa, they're back down and you're down in the trough and then back up again. How long does it take you to go from the top to the bottom and back up to the top again? So when we're describing waves, um, we've got to come up with a measurement system for that. And it's going to be related to with this statement right here, the waves per time. There's actually a lot of different ways you can express it. Um, waves per second would be a very reasonable way of expressing the frequency. Um, cycles per second. Not a bad way to go either. A wave cycle per second. The one that we're going to use is our go to, even though they all mean the same thing. We're going to use Hertz. Hertz refer to the occurrence of something per second. Something per second is a Hertz. In fact, there's another one here that um, I could add to that. Sometimes I'll do this. Seconds to the negative one, which is the same as uh, one over seconds. One over seconds, something per second. When you're trying to make units cancel out, that's actually the, the nicest way to see how the units cancel out. But we'll always label frequency in hertz, but it's really equivalent to any of those. Of course, you're familiar with hertz from um, electronics, you know, like with computers. For a long time, computers, the only thing that was changing was the processing speed. And you would, uh, like my first computer probably did uh, its processor in, in kilohertz how many thousands of cycles per second it could compute, computational cycles per second. And then my next computer was in megahertz. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, we're just killing it now. Millions of cycles per second. And that was gigahertz. Crap, I don't even know how big a giga is. A billion? It's a, it's a lot of hertz, though. That's a lot of hertz. Sounds like a smackdown or something. And then. Uh, you know, eventually we'll get to terahertz. That's when artificial intelligence comes alive and we're destroyed. Skynet goes online, Terminator starts dropping in from the future. Just around the corner. Looking forward to that. Um, has anybody played around with the uh, MyHeritage app with that AI thing that they do with it? You take an old picture yeah, of it. My the, grandpa sent that to my mom yesterday. I did one with my dad the other day. He, he passed away a few years ago. It was his high school graduation picture, or his, no, his prom picture. And uh, you upload the picture to the app, and it uses deep fake artificial intelligence, and it brings them to life. It's the freakiest thing. It's so sick. Yeah. They move really, like, weird. And they say uh, this kind of stuff, there, there's a whole bunch of developers that are getting close to making this a common thing, like you can make whatever you want. This is just for uh, basically to sell their, they're like an ancestry DNA company. 
So they're doing it as more of a marketing thing. But uh, let's see. Isn't that weird? Yeah. The still picture from the 1940s or something like that. No, not 19, late 50s, 1950s. But uh, just the fact that, and then you can actually select different things that the face does. Like they can have it look up or just look back and forth and from the, do a little bit of a smile and it all looks like real. It's like freaky. So they're saying basically in about another two or three years, what you think is real, twice nothing you're going to see in the future is going to be real even if you see it with your own eyes maybe i don't know i just want to be in teaching when that happens why do i have to be they just can put a i can put my head on anybody anyhow uh energy. So uh, this is going to be pretty easy. Symbol E. Don't have to go Greek for that. Capital letter E for energy. Don't use lowercase e. That might get confused with the electron. And we're going to measure that in the units of joules. We haven't worked a lot with energy yet in this course, but joules is our go-to metric energy unit. And capital letter J is the abbreviation for that. So we could work with like small quantities of joules, millijoules, we could work with big quantities of joules, kilojoules, but joules is the base unit. I don't have any pictures to draw for that or anything else to say about energy, it's just energy. So it, in a, 10 minutes or so from now, I'll be talking about uh, the mathematical relationship between those three things. But before I get there, I want to talk about the types of waves and the types of waves we're going to be studying in particular. Now, it's up to you if you want to write this slide down, it's not necessary, but there's different types of waves. I talked about water waves a little bit. It's easy to visualize. They've got wavelengths, they've got frequencies, and they carry energy. I mean, water can be pretty destructive on shorelines, and especially when there's a lot of energy in that water. Big waves. Sound waves, they carry energy as well, enough so that they make your eardrums vibrate. Later on in the course, I'm trying to think what this would happen, probably towards the middle or end of April, I bet this big tube in the back of the room sitting up on my cabinets, big metal tube. Um, I run sound waves through that with natural gas and I light it on fire and you can see the sound waves in the fire. That's kind of cool. So we'll, we'll take a look at sound waves later on. Not because we want to see sound waves, but just because we want to see fire. So, you know. And then there's a uh, Electromagnetic waves, and I highlight that one because that's the type of wave that we need to study and understand in order to be able to do uh, the electron stuff that we want to do. So all these have energy, wavelengths, and frequencies, but our focus is going to be this time, this one. And the equations that we use are going to be specifically developed for electromagnetic waves. Speaking of those electromagnetic waves, you are familiar with that, perhaps through song. Um, but you've uh, you've studied electromagnetic waves probably at one time or another in your education, and we're going to be looking at those a little bit here today and a little bit more on Monday. Um, but in the electromagnetic spectrum, we generally break it up into seven parts, and we're describing them uh, basically parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we just compartmentalize it so it's easier to discuss for humans. Does anybody know one of the segments of the electromagnetic spectrum? 
I'm ultimately going to put it in order. So if you know it in order, you can. And that stuff? Sorry, I missed that. Is it like the UV rays? UV is one of them. Um, I will put UV in right there. Ultraviolet light, UV light is an electromagnetic wave. That's another. Uh, gamma rays? Gamma rays, working on the bottom of the list here. X-rays. Filling the gap with X-rays. Microwaves. So, I love microwaves. I love microwaves. Visible light? Visible light, can't forget about that one. Infrared radiation. Infrared light. Um, and then radio light. She knows the song. And the song. So uh, seven parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, there's actually, it can be divided up into subcategories too. Like in radio waves, for example, we've got UHF, VHF, AM, FM, just to name a few. We assign literally assign like radio stations to them. So all of the different parts can be uh, subdivided, but this is the basic way that we're gonna organize things, the things. And uh, I put them in order just because I want to kind of describe them in terms of energy wavelength and frequency. Putting them in order helps that. We'll talk more about these guys on Monday. But if I'm looking at these waves in terms of wavelength, can anybody tell me in terms of long versus short? Which ones are the longest waves? Which ones are the shortest waves? Or just which one's the longest wave? Or which one's the shortest wave? I don't care. Give me one. Long or short? Are gamma lens the long rays? The big one? Opposite. Yeah, these are the these are the short ones. And these are the long ones. And I do have them in order. So we're going from longest to shortest when we organize the list this way. Now, if you think about it a little bit in terms of uh, short wavelengths versus long wavelengths, if the waves are moving at the same speed, which they are, all electromagnetic radiation travels at the same speed, if they're traveling at the same speed, but some have short wavelengths and some have long wavelengths, which one will have the greater frequency, the more frequent, more wave cycles per second, the shorter wavelength. So this is gonna be, we'll call it high frequency, and this will be low frequency. Low frequency is Alex giggling every once in a while, and high frequency is just a nonstop hysterical giggle fest. And then if we look at energy, who's the low energy, who's the high energy? Low energy is radio. Yeah, we're not too worried about radio waves. They're low energy. They're around us all the time. And we don't, don't lose much sleep over that. But if, uh, if we had to worry about gamma rays, that'd be a problem because gamma rays will kill you. That's pretty much what they're good at, killing life. Everything except cockroaches for some reason. They seem to be able to survive everything. And uh, crabs can survive a lot. Pill bugs. I think it's pill bugs. I think that's those things that apparently don't die. Somebody's got to be along when we do a, you know, when Skynet comes online and takes out humans. Something's got to be the next life form cockroaches and pill bugs and crabs and whatever lives at the bottom of the deep sea vents. Um, 
this is just more of what I just did there, but I'm going to do a little compare and contrast in this form, just to be clear. My wave A. Just a little bit more uh, <clears throat> visual way of comparing wavelength, frequency, and energy. Wavelength, we got long and short. Who's the long wavelength? A. And it's not like, I mean, this is just relative, so I guess it could be say longer and shorter. Just comparing them to each other, it's not uh, set to scale or anything. Uh, high frequency, low frequency. Which one's the high frequency? B. E. High energy, low energy, a greater energy is associated with. And then um, when it comes to worrying about electromagnetic radiation in your life, because we got we use a lot of it and we produce a lot of it. Uh, our technology really centers around the use of electromagnetic radiation in one form or another. Um, this side of the spectrum will have less danger associated with it. This side will have more danger. Because the more energy the waves carry, the more damage they can do to uh, living things, destruction to cells and DNA and things like that. So on the um, long wavelength, low frequency, low energy side, you know, we've got things like radio waves. You guys aren't worried that there's radio waves around you all pretty much all the time. Passing right through you. Um, there's Microwaves. You don't seem too concerned with it because you carry a microwave transmitter in your pocket right next to your gonads. And nobody seems too concerned that they got a microwave transmitter receiver sitting in their pocket. Like my grandma's always weird about 5G because she doesn't kill us. Like, well, the, that, like, what, like, where is that? That's why the, the um, I was over Christmas break. There was that bomber in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and I was actually like in Nashville, Tennessee when that happened, which was weird. But um, uh, the guy was convinced that 5G was going to kill people, and apparently he knew some things about electronics, and he worked for companies that worked with the, this stuff, whatever. And he blew up uh, an AT and T communication center because. He was so pissed off about 5G. 5G. So some people are strongly concerned about that. 5G, it's, uh, it's going to be the microwave part of the spectrum. Yeah. Because that's what, uh, that's what, so, you know, you think your cell phone's using radio waves, but it's actually higher in energy, higher in frequency, shorter wavelengths. The, the higher the energy, uh, wavelengths you use, the more data you can put on the device. The thing with uh, higher frequency waves is they don't travel distances as well. That's why the 5G uh, transmitters are, they're putting them all over the place. They've got, the old network doesn't work for that. They can't just swap off the old towers. They got to add more towers and more relay stations. 
but you got more energy. Now you got more transmitters. And of course, there's that one frequency of microwaves that makes water molecules vibrate. That's the one they put in your microwave oven, 2.5 gigahertz. Don't want to use that one in your pocket. Otherwise, it would be like a little heater there cooking everything. Um, but yeah, there, there's, I think there are some reasons to be concerned, but supposedly they tested it out. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were slow to adopt. It's like, let, let, let Japan do it first, see if they're still okay in a couple of years. I'll let Korea do it. Okay, Korea's still going. Eh, okay, we'll try it now. And then we'll look back and say, uh-oh, Japan's dying. We better stop doing what we were doing. Get rid of it. Oh, but I'd like the speed. Okay, we'll keep it. That's pretty much how it will does go. Does that sideways T thing that we draw a wavelength on, does that have a name? Uh, I call it just the baseline. I'm not even not even the T part, but just the line. We just call it the baseline. Uh, so radio waves, microwaves, not so bad, maybe, hopefully. Uh, infrared light. Infrared light is heat. Like when you feel the warmth coming off of a fire. That's infrared light. Um, your oven is an infrared emitter. And then uh, infrared and then uh, visible. Nobody's worrying about turning on the lights unless you're a vampire and burst into flames. And that's only sunlight, right? It's not the light. Must be a frequency that only the sun produces. Uh, but when you cross over into ultraviolet, now you start getting into a higher energy, can disrupt uh, DNA and uh, affect the uh, way your cells replicate, and cause cancer and such. Um, X rays, got to limit your dosages of that. And uh, then get gamma. The other two didn't kill you. Gamma will get you. It's hard to stop gamma rays. Where are they? They are fortunately not very common on Earth. You can get them on Earth uh, in radioactive materials, like highly radioactive, like in a power plant, nuclear power plant. That's one of the things you'd be worried about, uh, containing the gamma radiation. Uh, the sun produces massive amounts of gamma radiation, but fortunately, our Earth's magnetosphere shields us from being annihilated by gamma radiation. When you think about it, our planet's a pretty amazing thing because not every planet is, if you don't have a molten core, you don't get the uh, magnetic protection. So, um, yeah, I don't know how life on Mars is going to work. We'll let Elon figure it out. When people get radiation sickness, is that because like too many gamma rays? Uh, it, it can be. It can be. Uh, gamma rays will take you down pretty quick. Um, and then you have alpha particles and beta particles, which are actually physical particles. Uh, a beta particle is a, a fast moving electron, and an alpha particle is the nucleus of a helium atom. Uh, those are actual particles. Gamma radiation, though, is pure energy. And yeah, we'll uh, kind of uh, rattle your your molecules apart. What's a gamma particle? No particle, just pure energy. This is a symbol for a gamma ray. Like a dead, dead Jesus fish. Alpha particle? You know, that, that's all good. Well, actually, we get an alpha particle like this. That's an alpha particle. Get up to gamma radiation. <laughs> You're dead. Well, if I didn't keep you alive, because you can't swim, you'll probably be dead because I flew in that shot. Yeah. All right. Uh, energy. Now, the next thing, if you just want to give a little subtitle. And uh, maybe this would be a good time if, like, you're getting near the bottom of the page, just to, like flip the page over. Um, type the uh, mathematical relations. We're going to look at three equations. 
that relate energy and frequency, energy and wavelength, frequency and wavelength. Three different equations. I think I've already mentioned this, but this is all the math for this chapter. So we're going to have these three little algebraic equations, and we just got to know how to use them. The rest of this chapter is concept focused. So when it comes to energy and frequency, if I actually were to go back, and it's going to be gone radio waves and gamma rays down there at the bottom. Um, in terms of energy and frequency is what we're talking about. You'll notice that they go low together and as they go down, they get higher together. So they're always going in the same direction with each other. So those two variables have to be a direct relationship. energy and frequency. One goes up, the other goes up. And it's pretty easy to graph that way. Likewise, one goes down and the other goes down. But if we increase the frequency of the wave, we are increasing the energy. Now, when you uh, <clears throat> have a direct relationship, the variables, energy and frequency, are divided by each other when they're equal to a constant. So we have a constant that we use for this equation. We give it a letter H. And it's going to be the energy divided by the frequency. They have to be equal to this constant. When the denominator goes up, the numerator has to go up, this constant can't change. This equation is usually not expressed in this form. This is the way you're likely to see it in a textbook. And I, pretty much every time you see this equation, it's going to be rearranged to look like this. So that's one of our three big three equations that we're going to be using. And in that equation, obviously E is for energy. And it's really important that when we put things into this equation, we only put things into the equation in the units of joules. And then if we use the right units point into the equation, we know that when we solve for this equation, if we solve for energy, it would come out in joules as well. Frequency. We're going to use Hertz. Watch out for things like kilohertz and megahertz and gigahertz. Whatever hertz it is, it's got to be in the base unit of hertz for the equation. And H, our constant, is a special constant called Planck's constant. We got a number for that, which will help us solve things. The number is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules a second. Joules times second. But in chemistry, we work at the biggest numbers and the smallest numbers. So we're not going to solve anything with this. I'm going to be letting you do that um, after I introduce you to the three equations. But um, you look at what's given in the problem. You identify, you know, oh, there's energy and frequency being mentioned in this problem. You know, you got energy and frequency. You know, you can use this equation and Planck's constant. What's the unit? 
joules times seconds. The official uh, metric SI abbreviation for seconds is just a lowercase letter S. I often do SEC, but uh, it is just S. Let's take a look at the uh, next equation. We're going to look at wavelength and frequency. How they connect to each other. I'm going to go back to my arrows and just see how wavelength and frequency uh, go up or down or left or right or are they going in the same direction or what. So uh, looking at wavelength and frequency, one's big when the other's small, one's small while the other's big. So it seems like they're going opposite directions of each other which would suggest an inverse relationship. Perhaps something like that. The wavelength goes up you can be certain that the frequency is going down. And the opposite is true as well. So in an inverse relationship, the variables are multiplied by each other and set equal to a constant. This equation C is gonna be our constant. That's to go to equations. This goes up, and that goes down because C doesn't change. Now, C is something that you're familiar with. Anybody know what C is going to represent? You've heard about it or, or seen it in other equations, not necessarily in my class, but you've heard about it in like E equals MC squared. Einstein's famous equation. Anybody got an idea what C is? Velocity. Light. Light. Turns out that the speed of light um, no matter what you're talking about, if you're talking about visible light or ultraviolet x-rays, gamma rays. Visible light travels at the speed of light. Ultraviolet and infrared travel at the speed of light. Microwaves travel at the speed of light. That's why there's no lag between your conversations on your cell phones. Uh, gamma rays and radio waves, they all travel at the same speed because they're all electromagnetic waves and all these electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. Which is, 0, 0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Pretty fast. This is um, this is the reason why we have to use meters when we put wavelength in there because it's got to work with the units that are in the constant. And that's why uh, Hertz can be thought of as reciprocal seconds because it's got to work with the seconds 
in a the constant as well. So then, of course, we've got wavelength. has to be in meters and frequency, which has to be in hertz. But this is where um, reciprocal seconds is nice because you can see how the units cancel out when you do it this way. One over second, anything per second is a hertz. So if you want to see units cancel, you use reciprocal seconds. <clears throat> and we got one other to look at, and then we're done for the notes. Last equation. You got a half a page, you're good. So energy and wavelength is our last one. We go back to those arrows. We see the wavelength getting shorter as you go down the list, but those waves are becoming more dangerous as we go down the list because they have more energy. So uh, this turns out to be an inverse relationship. If I increase the wavelength of the wave, the energy of the wave goes down. So as we move towards radio waves, the wavelengths get bigger and the waves become less in energy. So the way I'm going to show this, it's really a combination of the two equations before that. So if we know that E equals H times V, and we know that C equals wavelength times frequency, one thing that they both have in common is the variable V, uh, the, the new frequency. So if this is true and this is true, then what we can do is rearrange speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. And then get frequency equals speed of light divided by wavelength. And by doing that, I can take this. Substitute it into here. And give us the third equation. That relates energy and wavelength. And we've got two constants, but you know, a constant times a constant makes another constant, I guess. Technically, you don't need this equation because you can solve for frequency with one equation and take that answer and plug it into the other equation. Like literally just use two equations to get the same answer. But most people like to do it with one equation, so that's why we show this. So the last thing is, um, of course, that's energy. And it's got to be in joules. That's wavelength. That's got to be in meters. Six point six two six and the negative thirty four joules times seconds, which is why we have to use joules for our energy. And C 
3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters over seconds. And again, that's why we have to use meters when we plug in numbers for our wavelength. So those are the three equations. That's where the most of the math will be. You'll knock that on the first page of the test when we get to the chapter four test and you'll be done with the math for the chapter. Um, what I've got here is the assignment that goes along with that. The back side is all the math problems. You'll put those three equations to the test. The front side is just uh, basically a review of your notes. So it should look very much like your notes. You can just kind of scan through your notes and jot down the so my only advice with this when you get to the back side just make sure you put in to the equation joules meters and hertz if it comes to you in kilohertz, do a little factor label, convert to hertz first. If it comes to you in kilojoules, convert your kilojoules into joules before you plug it in. If you got uh, anything that's not joules, meters, or hertz, convert it to joules, meters, or hertz before you solve it algebraically. And that. And then for all of you at home, uh, we're just going to use this last 20 minutes of class to work on this assignment. So you are free to log off if you like it, do it in the quiet of your own space.